Hello, everyone. Welcome back to Duel of the Takes. Today, we are covering a uh, much anticipated topic. Uh, Wes Anderson's filmography as of uh, what? May 2022. We've got 10 feature length films that we are discussing today. Uh, his shorts aren't aren't going to qualify for this list. Uh, we are joined by a very, very awesome panel. Uh, it's me and Alden here, but we also have friend of the show, Aaron McKennedy and uh, friend of the community. We got we got uh, pilot. Hello there. Or the pilot or or Ben. I don't know. Everything works. And uh, why do you think we selected you guys to be here? Um, avid West Anderson fan. Too, as of a month ago. Definitely. I think you added me because uh, I watched all of them with you guys, so I was like, eh, why, why not do it? Because, uh, Jesus, I've watched all ten in a short period of time, and it was quite a trip, and I'm ready to uh, review it. Um, so the way this is going to go, everybody's got a single veto uh, that you can use up until the top three. Alden is going to place a number 10. Pilot's going to go for nine. Aaron for eight. And I'll go for seven. And then that should take us uh, to the top three, where after the vetoes are null, it'll just be an all out debate for ranking the, the rest of the filmography. So this should be fun. Alden, what is Andr Wes Anderson's worst movie? I don't know if this is a hot take or not, but I I kind of think it's Bottle Rocket. Interesting. Which like strong start, that's for sure. I don't know. I just it doesn't work as well for me as some of these others. What I kind of really like about Bottle Rocket personally is that it feels very much like a 90s movie. It feels very much like a kind of independent movie made yeah. uh, with a relatively small budget, like post Reservoir Dogs. You know, it exists in that same kind of uh, like budget in production, but I mean, I think Wes Anderson's style gets like cemented very early on. Like there's there's little nuances and quirks, especially with the writing and the dialogue that I'm like, oh, these are Wes Anderson characters still. I don't know. I mean, comparing it to the short that I also watched for it, uh, feature length is better. I like it a lot. Don't get me wrong. It's just I don't um, I don't think I can buy into it quite as much as even what I have placed next. I don't know. Aaron, what's your thoughts on uh, Bottle Rocket being placed at number 10? Does that make sense for you? Um, I wouldn't put it at number 10 just because that's also like, I mean, he like discovered the Wilson brothers and that was yeah like their first, you know, film. So I wouldn't place it at 10, but um, I would agree that it's definitely not up there for me. Pilot, what do you think about Bottle Rocket. Is it bottom of the list for you as well? It's close to the bottom, actually. I put Bottle Rocket on number nine. Yeah, it's my number nine as well. It's not the one I disliked the most because I liked all of them, but it definitely lacked something that the other movie had. One of my favorite scenes is when uh, I think Owen Wilson's swimming in the pool and Luke's telling him he's like shouting from the balcony of the hotel like, we really have to, like, you know, stay low key and, like, we need to change our appearances so no one knows who we are. And they're, like, yelling this. It's, like, that's that kind of, like, dry humor that I think kind of carries a lot of the, like, I, I don't want to say more weird Wes Anderson movies, but, like, that's a staple to uh, uh, his his comedy. And uh, I absolutely love that scene in particular. It, it, it had me cracking up when we rewatched it. And, like, the fact that they show, like, the heist and it goes south and it's, like really really funny i just think he's made similar movies that i like more um but yeah bottle rocket number 10 yeah uh pilot to you what are what is getting placed at number nine or i guess i should be asking what's the lowest movie on your list yeah pretty much rushmore whoa i know i, I knew this was gonna come as an a take to be honest i i knew <laughs> but to be yeah yeah i uh i'm not a big fan of rushmore to be honest why is that is it because all the characters are unlikable? Is that the problem? Well, there's that, <laughs> but I think that was a quirk of the movie. But I didn't really care about the whole plot of him trying to bone his teacher. I think it was a bit on the way. Yeah. And they could have done more stuff with the kids than just do this dumb, weird fucking romance. Sorry, I don't know if I'm allowed to swear here. That's yeah, fine. I don't know. I feel like I, I get that. I get that. And there's there's some great fucking shots and all the plays into the fucking movie 
I love them, but I, again, the composure of the whole movie always holds itself together. Rushmore's just... That dinner scene where Luke Wilson shows up and he's just a dickhead to him the whole time is got to be one of the most uncomfortable scenes in any of the Wes Anderson filmography. It's so bad. That is something I have with this movie, and I don't have it this slow, but it's not too much higher. Um, it did just make me feel uncomfortable. I like the montages and like you're seeing like all the clubs and stuff that he's in, and it yeah. feels very like now Wes Anderson, but like in this kind of yeah really awkward and bad coming of age story. Like <laughs> the fact that Bill Murray like steals the teacher away from him from that character's perspective and then he's like i'm out to ruin this guy's life now it's so painful it's so cringe inducing i do appreciate that though that's funny i like the setting a lot i like this boarding school where all these kids are like destined for ivy league and, and all that it's like it's very much like if you put dead poet society it turned it totally on its head and it's like a really dark comedy and i like that I do. I'm sorry. I just love the line with Luke Wilson where he's like, it's an OR uniform. He's like, oh, are you? <laughs> also, just watching Bill Murray's character like deteriorate throughout the whole movie was like pretty entertaining. Great performance from him. I think it was kind of almost like a bit of a comeback role for him. Not necessarily that he was like making bad movies or whatever, but like he was on a hot streak in the 80s and early 90s. And I think like, I don't know, there's just something with with Wes Anderson and uh, Bill Murray. Like they they see eye to eye on it. Almost everything like they he's in like all of his movies. And I've seen like behind the scenes of how Wes Anderson like works with his casts and stuff like that. And it's all like kind of like a commune like they all like live together and eat dinner together every day even when they're not filming and when they rehearse their lines it's, it's very very new age but i think i think that there's a reason why bill murray liked this character so much and like took it on i mean this movie's only what six years removed from garfield <laughs> yeah anyone using a veto here i i probably have rushmore the highest on my list it's it's in my top five i think well you could use it yeah no it's not in my top five i don't think i'm i don't think i'm gonna veto it i, I think there's others i'd want to protect uh it's, it's my number six okay okay anybody else no this is fine i'm not upset with it i don't care enough about rushmore to veto it all right well, I guess we're moving on to uh, Rushmore at number nine. Aaron, what is what is going at number eight? What is the lowest movie left on your list? It's so hard because I literally love all of his movies, but I'm gonna have to probably say for number eight, it's Isle of Dogs. I agree. That's my number ten. That's I think that that's my least favorite Wes Anderson movie. But why why is it why is it so low for you? Like it's it's not even that I didn't like it. It's it's not that. It's just like it. Like, Wes Anderson does this thing where, like, his characters are quirky and weird, but you can always, in some way, like, relate to the characters. They have, like, some level of relatability to them. that You can't with that movie. Like, I didn't get, like, a t really attached to anybody. Yeah, the one thing I can say is it's not, it's not easy to keep up with which dog, like, which one is which. Whether what they've done, where they were, any of that. There's not as much stylistic difference between the characters as there was in something like Fantastic Mr. Fox. And so that is probably why I agree. I don't really care. But I will say that the animation is top tier. Yeah, I agree. Oh, I was going to say, like, visually, it, like, it looks awesome. And, like, it's a good story. But, like, like you said, like, with Fantastic Mr. Fox. And the other thing with the, the advantage, in my opinion, that Fantastic Mr. Fox has over Isle of Dogs is it was a Roald Dahl story. And, like, Roald Dahl stories are, like, fucking amazing. So I think it's kind of hard to follow up a stop motion film with such, such like, a niche sort of um, artistic styling with after coming off of something like Fantastic Mr. Fox. And I think like just because of the format, like it's they're probably the two most similar movies in his entire filmography. For me, I could probably watch Fantastic Mr. Fox like any given day. Like I think that that movie's got like the perfect pacing and there's a lot of really funny like scenes and moments. But like Isle of Dogs for me, I, I think just yeah, I think it just comes down to the characters is like I didn't really find any like major plot point or like thread uh as relatable as you know some of the more out there things that happen in some of these other movies like none of the characters really feel as developed or as fleshed out as even the characters like supporting roles in fantastic mr fox yeah 
I think that I think that this is a good spot for it. I uh, I was told that it was a scorching hot take that I had it as my least favorite uh, before recording. Really? I don't know. I still think it's kind of a hot take, but I don't I don't know how scorching it necessarily is. Alrighty, it's my turn to play some movie here, and if you guys think that this has been you know very calm and level headed and balanced so far, you're right. Oh God. My number uh, eight is the lowest movie that is yet to be discussed, and what I think belongs at number seven is the Royal Tenenbaums. Oh, okay. I think that this movie gets a lot of credit for kind of being like the first Wes Anderson, Wes Anderson movie where like he developed his style to a certain point where, you know, uh, from there on in his career, you can you can very much tell without maybe even watching a whole scene like, oh, this is a Wes Anderson movie. And I love this cast. I think everyone in it is incredible. Um, I think that the the characters in the setting with um, you know, them being these like three prodigies in some respected way. And then they all kind of, you know, it's all a facade. And this family is just like deeply broken. Uh, one of the last great Gene Hackman performances as well. And I, I, I like I like a lot of elements of this movie. But as a whole, I just don't find it as endlessly rewatchable as most of his other movies higher on this list for me. Um, and I also think like because it is such an ensemble cast, there's not a ton of major development with most of the characters. I think especially like Ben Stiller's character kind of just like is, is almost just there for comedic relief. And it's it's kind of painful because like everyone else is getting all these great scenes and moments. And I love Gwyneth Paltrow in this movie. I'm not normally a Gwyneth Paltrow fan, but she's great. And uh, yeah, with Luke Wilson as well. Um, there's a lot of good moments in this, but holistically, I, it's just not my favorite. I, uh, I'm going to second that. I'm getting support on this take. Okay, cool. <laughs> See, I have this at my, uh, number nine. Wow. Yeah. We're all surprisingly agreeing. Yeah. I think, I think this was a safe pick for you. I don't know if we're getting vetoes this time. I just know that there's there's people out there that this would probably be like their number one. Like, I appreciate it a lot and I love the cast, but it's just yeesh. Why? Because there's incest? I feel like he's done worse than that. Hence Rushmore or Moonrise Kingdom. It's really not the worst, especially having signed the the petition we all know and <laughs> we all know about. You're really you're really bringing that up. Well, you know, uh, always important to mention it. I didn't, yeah, the I love my brother, it was always, it kind of felt put in just to cause drama and to cause more thing as, like, to be natural. And I think, yes, it's nice to see New York and everything, but it's something we see in a lot of movies. I really didn't feel like there was much of a unique team and sense of the movie compared to, let's say, uh, the Life Aquatic, which has like you know just the freaking costumes and the shoes and everything perfect. Like it, it has its own style to it. But I can't say the same for the Royal Tenenbaums. It could be a movie any another director got made. Yeah. I, I could see that to some degree. All right. Well, Alden, we're back to you with number six. No one's used a veto yet. This is this is getting intense. I don't think they're going to get used, if I'm being honest. I don't know. We'll find out. I think my next lowest is the Darjeeling Limited. Hmm. Uh, number, number six? This one might be a hot take, but also... Yeah, I mean, it's not my number six, but I'm fine with it at number six. I agree. Yeah, no, I like this one a lot, and I think... This is, I think this is the one where he kind of falls into his style heavily because uh, you can definitely see it in editing or what, whatever you want to say about the Royal Tenenbaums or even Rushmore. Uh, but this one is the one that is colorful, like has just all around looks incredible. It's colorful. The spirit of adventure also is like immensely. Yes, I just found it. I feel like this is another one where it was difficult to really care about these characters like i cared more about the side characters than the main ones and i think that's cool but also they were all short-lived side characters no one really stuck around more than five minutes the darjeeling limited what's really like interesting about this film to me is like yeah structure is so like loose at the beginning it's like you're kind of just thrown into the situation it's a very short movie i think it's just over an hour and a half 
and like the more it goes on like the the you learn uh like about the characters and it's presented in like a non-linear format like when they go back to the funeral uh and like them trying to get their dad's car i think that's probably one of my favorite scenes in the in the movie <laughs> yeah escalates so fast when like they, they they try to save those kids from the river and then it just like becomes an entirely different movie tonally and it's like it kind of hits you with the same like emotional tonal shift life aquatic does but in a different way and uh i don't know there's something about watching these movies in like kind of a binge the J darjeeling limited kind of stuck out to me as being like uh i think tonally one of the most consistent pieces he's made yeah um i i like this one but uh i also have it at five so i don't i could veto it i i guess i mean how do you feel about uh darjeeling limited uh aaron i'm gonna have to agree to say that like it was a little bit harder to get like attached or like anything but the, the colors in that movie incredible amazing but i i think i'm gonna have to agree to say that like i think five or six would be a good place for it all right you know what i'm gonna be that guy i'm gonna hit it with a veto i think that french dispatch is a weaker movie than darjeeling limited and i want to use a veto to put french dispatch below oh what what uh yeah no thank you do i make a case and try to win you guys over i think that's what the show's about okay uh, you can certainly try i love the french dispatch in in execution like like in, in concept but in execution i think it falls short in a couple of areas for me uh in like the way that it's probably the most segmented wes anderson movie to date like it has a lot of the same intricacies of like this layered storytelling and like a story within a story and um that kind of like editorial like pulse and beat it's it's very interesting uh and it's presented in a very clear way that's easy to understand but some chapters of this story just simply aren't as interesting as others and i think it's bookended in the best way where it starts really good and then it kind of slows down and you you got to see different stories play out. And I just it feels a little too um, feels a little too disjointed to me because then I'm really excited at the end again. I, I think the last segment's the absolute best part of the movie, but it's it's an hour since I last cared about what was happening on screen. And some scenes are a lot better than others. And I also think that big of a cast, like I was expecting a little bit more. And I think this is maybe one of the first ones to kind of like doesn't really let me down because I, I still really enjoyed the movie, but it doesn't feel like top five Wes Anderson to me um, at all. I, I, there's not like a, most of his movies leave me with some sort of like mood and some sort some sort of feeling, even if, you know, the characters are, are quirky, like there's still a consistent tone. And I just didn't find this one all that all that consistent. I don't know what the take what was your guys's takeaway from seeing the French Dispatch besides like, oh, this is a really well made movie but I don't know what it's trying to say, you know, like. I mean, I don't know if it really needed to say anything in particular, but I appreciated each chapter for what they were. Story, I don't know what to call them, but. Yeah, like vignettes almost. I just, if the first one was released as a short, it'd be one of my favorite shorts ever. Exactly. I, I, I don't know. I can't, I can't say that it being disjointed is really a hit against it, especially in the way that it was told. Because it was supposed to be. It's supposed to be completely dissociated from each other other than the fact that it's all published in the French Dispatch. And that's fine with me. I had no issue with that. Uh, I do agree that the middle of the movie slows down and you care a little less. Like, they're not quite as strong of stories. I, I don't know. I still really appreciate them. Like, the Timothy Chalamet whatever's going on with Francis McDormand. Like, that was wild to me. All of that. That was great. Oh, and the uh, the animation for the cop chase. Even on its like slower bits and weaker things, it's just kind of like still something about it is strong enough to keep your attention or keep you interested. I don't I don't really know if you lose interest for an hour. I'm going to have to veto this too. Okay, did you want to nominate something else cuz Darjeeling Limited is still available to be placed here. You don't have to use a veto unless you want something else thrown in the mix. Hmm. Interesting. Because I really liked Fresh Dispatch. Like, I was really enchanted by it. And knowing a bit more about the French culture, seeing all those references in the movie, also the history of uh, obligatory service in France, because that's the, that was the issue in that sketch, you know? Imagine you're fucking 18, and now you gotta go to Western Europe, fight some war, or some crazy Eastern Europe, sorry. 
like it's mind blowing and to fight for like a country or France because what you gotta know about France is that there's a lot of proud people there proud of being French that French heritage is tainted with uh, colonization war like general Napoleon and everything and they kind of relate to that you know so we have characters that go against that that say why should we die for a cause we don't believe in you know the rebellious teen and it's nice to see that being played out the way it was played and with the the play at the middle and the guy I, I, there's so many story elements that make sense and exactly like alden says if it was all short films some of them would be freaking amazing some of the parts are a bit eh, eh, eh. but yeah i agree it's like you want to know where it's on my list uh sure number two me too Okay. Well, I feel bad stripping your number two for my number five. So I think I've lost this official veto. Uh, and uh, Darjeeling Limited, number six. Dude, I don't know. Oh, 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 oh. Aaron with a counterpoint? I know, you know, a little bit about, like, French culture, too, and stuff. And um, I will say, like, there's some other movies out there that just, like, you have... Like, Sofia Coppola's Marie Antoinette. That was an amazing movie that, you know, was... I mean, it was contemporary, but it was a very, like, representative take on, like, Rococo France. At least in my opinion, it, to, like, to what I know. Or you have movies like Les Mis, with, like, the revolution and stuff. But if we're talking in terms of, like, Wes Anderson... I feel like the Darjeeling... Like, I love The French Dispatch. I thought it was a great movie. It, it Like, it, it was around a newspaper right and it it watching it felt like going through a newspaper but at the same time it's like the Darjeeling Limited is like like you look at that movie of Adrian Brody of Owen Wilson like that that is Wes Anderson so I think I Nate I think you might have kind of sold me on like maybe maybe not hold on hold on I feel like yes Darjeeling Limited is definitely a Wes Anderson film. This is where he falls into his style or whatever. But The French Dispatch is a showcase of everything he has done and can do, including animated segments or just uh, different forms of storytelling. So I don't... That's true. But the Darjeeling Limited holds its own. The French Dispatch wouldn't have happened unless the Grand Budapest had, in a sense of storytelling. And that's kind of what I think, too, is like in terms of being a showcase of everything that Wes Anderson can do, Grand Budapest knocks the French Dispatch out of the water, in my opinion. I think that that is literally a live action Wes Anderson cartoon movie. Like, it, it's incredible. And we'll, we'll talk about it more later, I, I promise. <laughs> but I was looking for that sense of like chaotic and like frantic energy in the French Dispatch. And there's a few moments like Owen Wilson on the bike and stuff like that's like very kind of similar. But it's missing that, like, anchor character that pulls you through all of these weird narratives. Um, I don't know. I feel like Bill Murray fits there. He's not he's in, he's not in it as much as, like, Ray Fiennes is. All right. Yeah, I, I think what works so well about Darjeeling Limited to me is the fact that it kind of captures, like, international travel in, like, 90 minutes where it's like, yeah, you're going out of the country, you know, things are weird. And like that, that brother dynamic of like, they all kind of hate each other, but like, they also wish that they didn't. And like, they're in this really weird situation and things are violent and, you know, they, they sneak a snake onto the train. There's a lot of like really dumb moments that you're like, damn, this would happen to me and my friends if we went to India. You know, it's like, it, it's really, really relatable. I, I, I think it's interesting that you know, this traumatic thing happens and they try to rescue a boy drowning and, and they, they rescue two of them, but they aren't able to save the third. And like Adrian Brody's like in the process of becoming a father and has to deal with the fact that he's the one who didn't save one of the kids. Like it, it's tough. Like it, it's a, it's a roller coaster, but it's so short and it's like, it's so melancholic, but at the same time, it's like, well, that was our trip to India. I, I don't know if it, it feels very like personal, but I, I don't think any of this is based on like a real story or a memoir or anything. It's interesting. Yeah, the uh, prequel short that he shot for it, um, Hotel Chevalier or whatever, really good and definitely complements it. Um, I just feel like maybe a shorter version of that 
should have been included in the movie. I think so, because... Because I feel like it adds a lot of context. Especially to Adrian Brody's character. Like, kind of sets up his major, like, plot arc. Like, his his development. It sets it up. It's kind of important, like it should, yeah. Hey, can I veto then? Because I don't want the French Dispatch to go this low. I'm going to say one last thing for the French Dispatch. C'est toujours meilleur en français. Thank you. Uh, Aaron, can you translate that for me? Uh, I'm not that fluent. <laughs> All right, let's put it to a vote. French Dispatch or Darjeeling Limited getting placed at number six. I'm cool with either. I think the Darjeeling Limited should be placed here. Pilot, what do you think should be placed here? The Jarling. Aaron, Jarling or French uh, Dispatch? I'm going to say French Dispatch. I think it makes more sense for Darjeeling Limited to be placed here. I, I, I It makes sense. Number six. We were close. Uh, you almost convinced me. You almost convinced me now. Kept me on the edge. You vetoed that and then you went against your veto. Yeah, I did. Like, I, I just don't want to force a tiebreaker here. We'll stick with Darjeeling Limited here. Um, So that was Alden's turn, I believe. So Pilot, what goes at number five? Oh, God. Don't break my heart two rounds in a row because I no longer have a veto. I will. Oh, no. Moonrise Kingdom. <sighs> All right, who's got a veto? Veto, veto. Because it was hard for me to put it there, too. Nah, veto, sorry. <laughs> um, Pilot, why do you think um, Moonrise Kingdom goes at number five? It's cute and quirky. I never went to camp, so I didn't relate much. I definitely didn't go to a camp like that. Guess I sort of did, but I don't know. If we're talking about the movie, I, 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 that's the one I didn't watch recently. I've watched it years ago. It, I'm biased when I place it there. Just, just want to let you know. <laughs> it's uh, nothing personal against it. I love the love story. Uh, like it's, it's a great movie, but the other ones just kind of have something more for me. Like it, it's really a personal list because I can't state to you a good reason why Moonrise Kingdom should be number four, or number three, or number two because it probably could be depend on the scope you're looking at it i just thought that it was like i said cute and quirky but it was the most cute and quirky wes anderson movie i, I really care about those children and about their passion and different they look like they're from a peter pan disney movie and just the, the color again the colors in that movie oh pure the shots also the composition and i love nature of course so just being in that part of the world uh camps and lakes uh, just it's beautiful it, it really gives off the vibe it wants to give off so moral of the story i really love more kingdom i really love it all right and aaron what are you nominating in its place what is this fight between oh um for fifth i would have french dispatch god all right why why fight for moonrise kingdom why do you think it's a better movie than uh french dispatch because it, to me moonrise kingdom is like okay well one the color palette i mean the color palette in all of his movies but like you can like distinctly tell like Susie Salmon's color palette versus like you know Sam's color palette and like the the red tones in it are freaking amazing but also um it's the only Wes Anderson movie in my opinion where it's like I remember what it was like being 12 years old and having like a crush on somebody like it gives you that whimsical like childlike it, like it whisks you away into that world like completely and it's like a feeling and emotion that like pretty much everyone on this planet can relate to in some way, shape or form, whether or not you went to camp or not. And it's it's like not only that, but they 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 took Susie Salmon's character as like a, a 12 year old and made her like a strong female independent character. Yeah. Yeah. I, I kind of have a bias here because Moonrise Kingdom was the first Wes Anderson movie I saw. Like right as soon as that hit theaters, I was like, that looks really interesting. I want to see that. And then that's kind of what launched me into being a Wes Anderson fan was like I wanted to watch everything he had made before then and uh it was it for me it was kind of like the one that opened the can of worms so to speak and I think yeah totally it, it captures that like feeling of like falling in love or having a crush for the first time and like it, it does th it does that thing very very well and I, I feel like there's not too many other movies that do that with characters and present that in like an earnest way where it's not like cringe, like it, real. T it, it's like close enough to real life, but it has that like glaze of being like from the, the perspective of a child. And I also really, really like some non-traditional uh, actor choices for Wes Anderson in this as well. Like Bruce Willis 
Never did another Wes Anderson movie, to my knowledge. I think he's awesome in this. Uh, Edward Norton kind of did like Grand Budapest and stuff like that, too. But like Edward Norton is kind of one of those guys that's apparently hard to work with. But I mean, he kills it in this movie. Like he's great in this one. It's really cool seeing certain characters kind of break the type that you associate with them. Um, and I, I really dug it. I, I think Moonrise Kingdom like succeeds in everything that it's setting out to do. Whereas I think the French Dispatch had high goals. But I think it fell short a little bit for me personally. It's fair. Alden, where do you lean on this on this debate? I know you like both of these movies. They're they're both higher than number five for me. But the French Dispatch is higher than Moonrise Kingdom is. I'm contemplating another veto, but I don't think it's gonna go my way. I also I'm also second guessing my list now that we've talked about all these because I really didn't discuss these movies after watching them. That's the point of the show. Yeah, I don't know. I'm going to veto. Let's add a third option. <laughs> Alden, what, what are you throwing into the fight? Uh, hot take. Fantastic Mr. Fox. Pretty a hot take. That is a hot take. Man, I know which one of these movies I like the least, and it's The French Dispatch. I, maybe, maybe I'll grow into that movie, like, once I watch it, like, two or three more times and catch it up with these other ones. Like, I don't know, but nothing about that movie really blew me away. Like, first time I saw Fantastic Mr. Fox, totally was like, how did they make this? Like, the stop motion animation is very, very impressive. But then, like, the, di the way they recorded the dialogue for Fantastic Mr. Fox, as someone who likes doing production audio blows my mind that they just had the actors lobbed up like they normally would be in the movie playing out these actions instead of like 90 percent of voice acting is done in like a booth and just standing there and saying your lines you feel the energy that everyone is like yeah doing the actions of their characters and it, it, it's incredible it's a technical masterpiece like i there's not a single imperfection within fantastic mr fox in my opinion all right well aaron Pilot, there's three movies now up for for discussion. Which one do you want to see go at number five? It's French Dispatch for me. I think that's getting two votes. Okay. Sorry, Pilot. <sighs> oh, it's all right. This is such a hard list because it's like, they're, none of them are bad. Like My top five are so close to each other in terms of like where I could place them. Yeah, especially like my top three, like they're honestly all interchangeable. Like I feel like any given day it could my, my list could totally change once we get into that upper echelon. I think we've weeded out any of the ones that I like don't love. And I think all these movies are incredibly well made. So it's definitely definitely a debate, definitely a struggle. But the last uh, nomination, I believe, goes to you, Aaron, at number four. And Pilot is the only one with a veto left, so if he doesn't like this one, he can he can fight another day. Life Aquatic. Uh, Pilot, please. I have Life Aquatic at number one, so I'm gonna have to veto that. So do I. Please veto. All right, and Aaron, why is uh, Life Aquatic of Steve Zizo this low for you? It Literally, this is the only reason. I love that movie, but there's three other ones that I love more than that movie. Fair. That like that's it, and I mean it's for me personally, it's number four is a toss up between Life Aquatic and Fantastic Mr. Fox. Um, Pilot, what are you nominating in the place of uh number number four here in the place of Life Aquatic? Mr. Fox. You nominated Moonrise Kingdom last round, so just just trying to remind you. Either Fant Fantastic Mr. Fox or. The Grand Budapest Hotel. I'm gonna have to need help in that. No, I want you to nominate Fantastic Mr. Fox. Okay, I agree. Let's go for Fantastic Mr. Fox. Man, so Fantastic Mr. Fox versus Life Aquatic of Steve Zizou here at number four. This is spicy. What do you think, Nate? I have these movies right next to each other on my list. Um, they share the number two and three spot. I think simply because Fantastic Mr. Fox works in more ways than Life Aquatic of Steve Zizou. I think my favorite is Fantastic Mr. Fox here, but I could be persuaded either way because either one of these movies could be my favorite Wes Anderson film. It just really depends on on the mood. But um, Life Aquatic, I saw a long time ago. I saw it probably right after I saw Moonrise Kingdom in theaters. And I was like, it, it threw me off because I didn't like the movie. It was the first Wes Anderson movie I saw that I, I was like, this is really weird. And I, I don't get what it's trying to say. It's it's very, very mean spirited for the most of the movie. And then it like tries to redeem itself. And I don't know, I guess I'm just an older person now. And uh, I found the tone of this movie a lot easier to digest the most recent time I watched it. And I would be lying if I said it didn't bring tears to my eyes. As weird as that death scene is, it's like 
damn, that that hurts. Like in the the music, the I we have we've gone this far without mentioning music. I think the score for the Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou and all of the David Bowie songs played in uh, Portuguese, I believe. Mm-hmm. Well, the the foreign music used on the soundtrack as well. It's it's an acoustic uh, uh, dream come true. I think that that movie sonically is is incredibly dynamic, and I absolutely love it. And Fantastic Mr. Fox, I think, just works on on more levels. Like that could be a kids movie. It could be a family friendly movie. Like. There's no reason why that movie shouldn't have made more money, in my opinion. But it's also very much, uh, you know, cut from the same cloth of, you know, these dysfunctional family movies like Royal Tenenbaums or the Darjeeling Limited. And it achieves both of those in, in an incredible uh, display. And like I said, it's a technical master masterpiece. I don't think that there's a single thing in Fantastic Mr. Fox that could be changed. Man, this is tough. I want to hear other people's opinions before I give my final verdict. I just think that Fantastic Mr. Fox was like like a stop motion masterpiece and that I don't think the Life Aquatic qualifies to go above it. Really, really close. It's just, I feel like Fantastic Mr. Fox was... I, I mean, like, geez, it was such a good story, too. Yeah, I, I agree. It's a tough choice, Sam, eh? when you love those movies. But yeah, Life Aquatic, it's the one that got me the most emotional. Yes. That's that's the biggest thing for me is I think I actually cared the most here. I have an issue with about half of his movies where I don't care enough about the characters on screen. But I don't know. Everyone in Life Aquatic I definitely got attached to, whereas Fantastic Mr. Fox was one of those where I didn't really care all that much. And he also annoyed me a little bit, just a smidge, um, which I don't know. I don't know if that's a fault in his writing or, or what, but... I love the fucks. I'm a big fan of animation. This one is, I mean, can't... Yes. No, in terms of animation, it's one of the best out there. That's just for sure. I have something for Steve Zizou, like I said. It's it's a little crush. A little nostalgia feeling of wondering. Yeah, I think that's the weirdest thing, is I had no knowledge of this movie prior to to a month ago. Yeah, well, same. You just see... Um... And it's definitely a huge, just... It's just a huge nostalgia feeling watching it. The first thing I, I learned about this movie was just seeing a meme with William Dafoe in the suit just chilling in New York. And like, what's that drip? What's that absolute drip? The disorganization of what goes on with the characters in The Life Aquatic is just... It's one of the things I love most about it. The top five is difficult for me. I just... Fantastic Mr. Fox is my number five. Life Aquatic is my number one. Yeah. Are either of these your number one, Aaron? No. All right. They're not mine either. I I think I'm okay with Fantastic Mr. Fox getting put here because of the discussion, but wow. I don't know. It's, it's difficult for me. I don't know exactly what to say. I feel like I didn't have that much fun with it, surprisingly. I don't know why. I feel like this is one that you should have a ton of fun with, but... It just didn't hit any emotional beats for me, really. That is... Grand Budapest is not only my favorite Wes Anderson movie, but I believe that is his best movie. I think that is probably one of Ralph Fiennes' best performances, and I think Saoirse Ronan was absolutely amazing in that movie. Okay. And just as a side note, I will say, just as somebody who's, like, huge into art department, the little Mendel's cake, like, cakes, how they did that, that was, like, the cutest, quirkiest thing ever like i love that <laughs> yeah oh yeah i can definitely see that i mean there's there's a decent well there's a few kind of big issues i could say for moonrise that i guess i can't can't reach that same number of issues with grand budapest grand budapest hotel so yeah it is difficult this is i guess for me I can say that the problems I have with Moonrise Kingdom probably put the movie below the accomplishments of the Grand Budapest Hotel. I feel like there's characters I care more for in Moonrise Kingdom and performances that are just incredible in it, but there's also great performances in the Grand Budapest Hotel, so I don't I don't know, these are very interchangeable for me. For me, number 3 would be Life Aquatic. But like I I I'd be okay if it was Moonrise Kingdom too. That hurts. Thinking from a production design standpoint or like coming at it from that standpoint i'm maybe moonrise kingdom should be at three because it i mean life aquatic and grand budapest like dwarf that because like the inside of this ship was just 
Like, that was off the chain. Oh, God. Oh, yeah. That was insane. Yeah, how big was that? Like, I, I want to see a zoomed out... Yeah, I want to see a zoomed out picture of all that. It just feels like the scale, even though it's really, like, not... It's not big or anything. It's not just huge, grand, whatever. But the, the feeling of it, it's just feels massive when you watch uh, Life Aquatic. And I think it's because of decisions like that where you just pan across the whole ship. But that one's just easily my favorite out of his. I kept saying that the top five was interchangeable. That one is not. Okay, it is my number one. Because like I said, I fell in love with the, with the plot, the character, the costume, the set, camera move, and the emotion it gave to me. Budapest Hotel was the first Wes Anderson movie I've... I have seen and I really, 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 really liked it. And yeah, it makes sense. It's in the top three and I wouldn't have it in any other way. It's adventurous. It feels large. I think it's probably the one I Wes Anderson movie where I feel like. And just this, they catch the sense of yeah. being in that time so well. It's great. It, and the characters, Lobby Boy. How can you not love Lobby Boy? I mean, <sighs> but it's Life Aquatic again. The weird fish they created <laughs> for the show and all those races that are funky. It's it's just those little tiny, tiny details grisping that I'm like... Budapest has that too, but I prefer the subtlety of, of it all, you know? I, for me, Zizou has to stay first, but Budapest really deserve it. So. It seems like every single person was given a different script almost, or told to follow a different vibe for Life Aquatic. And it just works really well where no one knows what's going on. The fact that it feels so improvised all the time, but there is so much attention to detail that it just can't be, is unmatched. The Grand Budapest Hotel is very organized and is very on beat the whole time. And it's great, it's just not what I prefer. When I was in Europe, my dad and I were literally going around and we'd look at a building and be like, that could be in the Grand Budapest. Like, that could be in a Wes Anderson movie. And, like, it, it... I mean, obviously not, like, exactly the same, but, like, that's what it looks like <laughs> over there. There's nothing in the Grand Budapest Hotel that hits as hard or is as funny as when the pirates just show up while he's just playing guitar on the back of the boat. At, at this point, it's like they kind of try and offer the same things, but with different tones and different executions. I don't know. I know which one I prefer, and it's the one that reminds me of Finding Nemo. Grand Budapest is definitely my number one. So, I mean, I, like, The Life Aquatic is such a good movie. It's just, there was just so many elements to Grand Budapest that, like, I fell in, like, absolutely in love with. And I mean, uh, like, that, it's just, like, for the, like, longest time, that's been my favorite movie, like, in general. So I'm a little bit biased. And I mean, like like you said, it is hard to pin these two against each other. So like, I think having both of these in the top two, regardless of which of them comes in first, it like, it, I mean, these are the top two, like. And also like, there's like, okay, I get like back to Ralph Fiennes character. There is such good, like subtle humor in that movie where like if if you're kind of listening and you hear it you're like oh like oh shit that was really funny like there's this one scene i think it's adrian brody's character says to him he's like you seem like a straight man and he goes well nobody's ever accused me of that that's hilarious like <laughs> <laughs> yeah i don't know there's just ralph fine's character like really really like made that movie and ag again like back to how the french dispatch felt like reading a newspaper the grand budapest felt like reading a book like they were introduced and then you go deeper and deeper into the story it's like reading the back of a book and then diving into it like the the format of that movie was just like like nothing i've ever seen that's uh yeah that's a fact i feel like there are and we've mentioned this there are something like Fantastic Mr. Fox can be done by someone else. I feel like there are some of his movies that can just... Someone else could probably take that script and, and do okay with it. But these two are so uniquely Wes Anderson. They're very different. Like, they kind of hit the same whatever, but they're, they are very different movies and hard to compare, which is why we're still here. But I think it needs to be... 
Aren't these... Aren't these a decade apart? Uh, yeah. Life Aquatic came out in 2005, I think. And, uh, yeah. Grand Budapest came out in 2014. I don't know. I don't think the number one of this list needs to be the most crowd-pleasing, sorry to say. That's a good argument, too. Also, I, I mentioned it earlier, but a, a zoomed-out shot of his boat or whatever, it's a scene in the movie. Um, it's the let me tell you about my boat. Oh, yeah, yeah, where it's like going through and showing the the dichotomy and the anatomy of it all. Like, I know where I'm sticking, but I don't know what arguments to make to try and sway you, because what I have to say great about Life Aquatic can also be said for <laughs> the Grand Budapest Hotel, so I don't, I don't know. I will say, this is like, me personally, the majority of the cast of Life Aquatic is stronger than the majority of the cast for Grand Budapest Hotel. That's true. I do think there's a lot of people kind of just playing bit parts in Grand Budapest, whereas everyone in Life Aquatic is, you know, serving some sort of role or purpose. The characters are so... Even Leia Sado, who was just a maid, I think. Great performance, but also there for two scenes. And there's characters that are there for only two scenes, three scenes or whatever in Life Aquatic, but their presence is still felt throughout the movie, whereas hers was kind of specific to the moments there. And I think that's kind of like a, a big chunk of that. I like um, that scene in Life Aquatic where, well, one, just the fact that Bill Murray treats all the PAs like shit. The unpaid interns. And then there's like that one that sticks around when everyone else leaves in the unpaid interns. Like there's some really good like film production humor within this movie, too, that I think is it's one of those things that you really only get in a movie that's about ma like 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 movie biopics like Ed Wood or something like Dolomite is my name for example like yeah. these movies about a filmmaker you really only get that sense of humor in this but this is like a wholly fictitious story that's like loosely based off of a real person and it's very very odd i i think one thing that why like life aquatic with steve zizu has such a big cult following and a, like a critical reevaluation because this movie bombed and like it was the first like wes anderson movie to kind of milk toast with critics upon arrival really i, I simply just think people weren't ready for it it's not a bad movie it's just like totally complicated and like a total like unique experience I, I just don't know if i don't know if that's a movie that will continue to like age well like like for me like because between like the amount that i liked it more the second time i saw it, it was probably the biggest jump any of these movies had upon a rewatch for me so i feel like at some point this could be my definitive favorite wes anderson movie but, like, I've seen Grand Budapest Hotel probably seven or eight times, and each time I'm, like, smiling the whole time. Even though there's, like, bleak parts of it, it's always, like, you're watching someone make art the entire time that movie plays. And uh, it's this perfect blend between an accessible film and something like art house cinema. Whereas I think Life Aquatic is relatively accessible, but it is also a lot more artsy. I think that... The Life Aquatic was, like, a beautiful, like, prelude to, like, the epic that is the Grand Budapest. Like, the Life Aquatic, like, Wes Anderson hadn't really, like, blown up yet or anything. Like, he he was still kind of, like, finding his footing artistically, it felt like. Like, he definitely had some, some ground, but, like, the Grand Budapest was, like, he was, like, he, he had found that like that spot like where it just like everything just like yeah I, yeah the grand Budapest hotel is definitely one where he figured out his formula and knew exactly what to do with it i it seems like life aquatic was a movie that came out at the wrong time but could only be made at the time it was there's also a lot to be said that i learned a lot about marine biology from this movie surprisingly even though a lot of it is just straight up fictitious there's a lot that's just straight up actually what happens which is kind of weird like for example the uh grant money i'm surprised that goes to a single person rather than the organization that the grant is supposed to go to <laughs> uh that's wild to me someone just gets paid to exist that's i need grants right now so alden wishes he was a trust fund kid and this is why this is why life aquatics better than grand budapest the fact that i 
didn't realize it was Kate Blanchett until you said something. She's incredible in this movie. Yes. I think Kate Blanchett might be one of the best performances in The Life Aquatic. Like, I think Willem Dafoe is is great as always, and I, I really like Klaus, is that his character's name? It's very funny, like, kind of like tough love at first, and then you realize he's like this, like, soft, like, vulnerable guy. Like, that, it's a good bit, and it's it's really funny, but, uh, man, no, I, I think Kate Blanchett's really good. Like, Owen Wilson's good. Like, I think characters are stronger in Life Aquatic as a whole, but Ray Fiennes in, in Grand Budapest is, like, I, he's the main character of that movie through and through. I, I You kind of hate Steve Zizou the whole movie. Like, he, he's not a good person, but you still, like... You hate him, but he has all the people that rely on him, and you still kind of sympathize a little bit with what he's trying to do. You want this to go well because he's surrounded by all these good people. <laughs> I, just the complexity of the characters in this movie outweighs it for me, even though in terms of quality, I, I do believe that you're right. The Grand Puda Best Hotel is, is better in that sense. But it's just, I would prefer to watch Life Aquatic every day than watch the Grand Budapest Hotel every day. But both of these movies could not be a background thing. If I turn it on, it's getting my attention. Oh, I was gonna say, I would argue that Ralph Fiennes' character did that too, because like his character, he's like taking advantage of like this older woman. You have like, he takes the lobby boy under his, like Zero under his wing. And then Zero has this like amazing like romance with this girl who has like, this like scar on her face and it's Saoirse Ronan and she has her own story too. And it's just like, and then there's the whole thing with the boy with the apple painting and that's a- But all of that revolves around what he does. Cause like his character is super complex and the story is being told about him, but there's just so much more going on in Life Aquatic than just Bill Murray. Like Ralph Fiennes, outstanding job, probably I mean, it's at least his favorite perform or my favorite performance of his, but it's also, I just, he's the only character I care about. Like, yes, there's a lot of other characters involved and are, you have at least five people, six people in Life Aquatic that I will follow until the end of the movie. How about we all read our group, our, our individual list? We'll leave it to me when I read the group list. Can I remake my list? It's, it's a split. Yeah, you have time. I'll read my list first. I've got number 10, Isle of Dogs. Number 9, Bottle Rocket. 8, The Royal Tenenbaums. 7, The French Dispatch. 6, Rushmore. 5, The Darjeeling Limited. 4, Moonrise Kingdom. 3, The Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou. 2, Fantastic Mr. Fox. And number 1, Grand Budapest Hotel. Uh, Aaron, what's your list? What you have here, like 10, Bottle Rocket. Nine Isle of Dogs, eight Rushmore, seven the Royal Tenenbaums. I would put the French Dispatch under um, Darjeeling Limited, Fantastic Mr. Fox, Moonrise Kingdom, Life Aquatic, and then Grand Budapest. So, number 10, Rushmore. Number nine, Bottle Rocket. Number eight, the Royal Tenenbaums. Number seven, Isle of Dog. Number six, the Darjeeling Limited. Number five, Moonrise Kingdom. Number four, Fantastic Mr. Fox. Number three, The Grand Budapest Hotel. Number two, The French Dispatch. And at number one, The Life Aquatic with Steve Sisu. All right, Alden, what's your list? I'm contemplating reading the one that I just moved some things around or reading my original. I think I'll stick with my original. 10 is Bottle Rocket. Uh, nine is the Royal Tenenbaums. Eight is the Darjeeling Limited. Seven is Isle of Dogs. Six is Rushmore. Five is Fantastic Mr. Fox. Four is the Grand Budapest Hotel. Three is Moonrise Kingdom. Two is the French Dispatch. And one is Life Aquatic. Alrighty, and here is the group list. Number 10, Bottle Rocket. Number nine, Rushmore. Number eight, Isle of Dogs. Seven, Royal Tenenbaums. Six, the Darjeeling Limited. Five, The French Dispatch. Four, The Fantastic Mr. Fox. Three, Moonrise Kingdom. Two, Life Aquatic with Steve Zizou. And number one, Grand Budapest Hotel. I hate to do it to you, but I, uh, I faltered on a couple of my own things, including my own veto this episode, and I think the popular choice is the correct choice this time. I don't know. I mean, you killed my first and second place. I'm sorry, Alden. 
This is Grand Control Debate Zone. <laughs> Alrighty, well, thank you everyone for joining us today, uh, Pilot. We what uh what what can we promote for you? You do tech reviews, uh, c camera equipment reviews. Exactly. There's some short films coming in soon. I have a new camera. Can't wait to show what I can do with it, and it uh, will come probably next week or this week. I'll keep you posted on my social media. Nice. Heck yeah. I'd love to see it. And Aaron, thanks for joining us as well. It was great to have you make your debut. Uh, we definitely probably should have had you on for the Studio Ghibli, so my, my apologies there. <laughs> Is there anything we can promote for you on this uh, this great platform of 70 devoted listeners? <laughs> if anyone wants a portrait, hit me up. <laughs> That's about it. <laughs> True. Alrighty. Well, this has been Duel of the Takes, Wes Anderson. Uh, yeah, interesting list this week. Thank you, everyone. Bye-bye. Goodbye, Alden. <laughs>